coming out and braving the weather tonight. Um, we have a really great program for you. Um, just a few words about housekeeping. Um, our bathrooms are located right outside the door there, um, and mints on the other side, there's a drinking fountain over there. Um, if you are, are not familiar with Liberty Library, um, please come in um, and check out some of our scientific resources. We have really great online resources as well as print resources. Um, so we've been really excited. This is the fifth program that we have partnered with Alliance for Science to do. And we've been just having so much fun seeing all the different experts that have been coming and talking to us. Um, so I'm going to introduce to you um, Sarah Sion. She does um, the Alliance for Science. Thank you. Thank you.
purpose of the bacteria was to kill hosts. And so that's actually not untrue, but really not true, true. So we're going to talk first about Neisseria musculi, which is a bacteria that we isolated in Tucson uh, I don't know, about five years ago. And, and then I'm going to talk about Francisella tularensis, which is a bacteria that's been around, they've all been around for a long time, presumably. Uh, and that bacteria was first described uh, in Tulare County, California, as the causative agent of rabbit fever and desert rheumatism. So both of those have some really important interactions. And I'm going to talk about how you figure out what some of those interactions are, right? And I don't have answer answers, right? That is, how everything really works and you can go home and you know tell your mom about how it works. But I do have ways that we've approached it and ways that it worked and bits of the conversations that we've been able to recover. So that's where we're going. The take home lessons. So that I was like, this, if you tell somebody it's like taught, I was just doing this for a long time. Because if you don't do that, they get really grumpy. Um, and so the three things that I want you to walk away from are colonization, that is the interaction between the bacteria and the host, requires attributes of both the host and the bacteria to work. That is to be successful. Successful meaning the bacteria lives in the host. The second thing is both commensals. So does anyone know what commensal means? Yeah? No. Okay. So see, I told you to stick your hand up. <laughs> commensal organisms, since we stole it from ecology, which is why it's not really an immunology word, right? It means two species that go together, but don't necessarily care very much about each other, right? It's kind of the intermediate between uh, symbiotic relationships and dysbiotic relationships, right? It's the one where we're here and you're here and that's cool, right? So that is you stay in your place, we stay in our place, we'll all be fine. So both of those uh, must evade or alter the host response in order to, to, to live there forever, right? Which is what they want to do. Uh, and pathogens and commensals are not fundamentally different. Right? They're really, you know, they just want to make more DNA, right? They just want to hang out and be there, right? And so we define them differently because we're pretty human-centric, right? Or animal-centric or plant-centric, right? We, we, want, we want to know what makes us sick. So stuff that can make us sick we call pathogens. But, you know, Often they're like weeds, right? You know what's the definition of a weed? A plant growing in the wrong place? Uh, it's, it's like that. So that's where we're going on this. Okay, so we talk about now, and it's very trendy, right? If you really pay any attention to sort of what's going on in sort of microbiology and immunology. Normal flora, right? That is the bacteria, viruses, and fungi and other archaea that live inside us or live on us and live in our nose and our gut and our ears and our skin and the vagina and all the places that we have places. Our lungs are sort of generically called the flora. So, so the, you know, the plant guys don't like that. So we stole the word, she can flower. <laughs> None of these make flowers. Uh, are critical for our development. So if you make a mouse that has no bacteria in it, which you can do by doing cesarean sections and making them live in a bubble, just like the bubble boy did right in the movie, their immune system doesn't develop right. right? Their gut doesn't develop right. They become prone to like all kinds of stuff that you don't want. So we know that these bacteria really are doing really important things in their conversation. What we missed until the last 10 years was a way to look at it, right? And, and so we need to, we've just recently been able to start to look at this in a, in a sensible way. And that's been a technological breakthrough caused by the advent of next generation sequencing. 
And so this is a fallout of the human genome project, which got done, and there were 20 bazillion DNA sequencers sitting around unused because we finished the human genome project, right? We got all this technology, and it was incredibly expensive to do before, and now it is cheap as dirt, right? I mean, really cheap. So to scale this a little bit for you, I have a postdoc, a well-trained biochemistry postdoc in my lab who spent two years sequencing one gene of 7,000 base pairs. Today, in one week, I, we can sequence 20 genomes on these machines, whole genomes, every base pair in the organism. So it's just astonishing how much that data has been able to become cheap. The other thing is alterations in the microbiome, the bacteria that live in your gut, and everywhere else, but mostly in the gut, can just have extraordinarily large impacts. So we know, for example, type 1 diabetes, the diabetes that kids get, right, caused by an autoimmune response to their own beta cell. If you have a mouse, there's, there are mice called NRB mice that get diabetes. 80% of the female mice get diabetes by 20 weeks of age. If I move those to a new mouse room, which is dirty, 10 of them get diabetes. Dirty being defined as got lots of bacteria in it, as opposed to clean, which has very few bacteria. Okay, so we knew that 20 years ago. What we didn't know is, okay, well, what do I do with that information? You know, so this is why you should have your kids eat dirt, by the way. Um, <laughs> because they like to eat dirt anyway, so you might as well just let them. Um, so the other thing is, you know, there's a whole ecological system inside you, and there's competition among bacteria for niches, right, places that they can live. And commensals, that is guys who were there first, can block the colonization by pathogens, things that make you sick. So that's why, you know, you see people, you know, people say, well, I should eat yogurt, and they say, well, I should it turns out the bacteria in yogurt actually don't colonize you very well, but it's, it's the right idea, just the wrong bacteria. So what we want to understand is how do the commensals negotiate with the immune system to bring about this kind of peaceful, beneficial coexistence. Okay, in olden days, olden days being 1995, uh, is this is how immunologists view the immune system as a pipe. The gut, right? It's a pipe. It starts at one end, right? Food goes in here, and food comes out here, right? And those pipes, right? It didn't break, right? It was all separated. So we knew there were a lot of bacteria there, and our view was they stayed there and here, and we stayed out here, and everybody was happy. That was how we coexisted. And we knew that if something bad happened, that is, you got your bowel perforated. So you got shot in the stomach, right? You remember all the cowboy movies where the guys get shot in the stomach and it takes them a week to die? Because they don't die from the wound, they die from the bacteria getting out into the, into the outside, right? Outside the pipes, and then getting sick from it. Well, that's, that's a, like many things, is true and not true, true. So now we know that that's not, that's incomplete. So there's a constant two-way traffic between things inside the gut and things outside the gut. And that traffic is organisms themselves, pieces of the organism, molecules, proteins, lipids, DNA, RNA, all the stuff that makes up bacteria comes out. And then there are even specialized cells in the immune system called M cells that, that stick their sort of toes into the gut, pull stuff out kind of regularly. So providing constant communication between what's on the inside and what's outside. And, and in fact, as we said, that this constant exposure is required for health. So one of the problems is when people get chemotherapy, right, and they go on lots of antibiotics, is they get sick as shit, right? That would be the medical term, right? Um, that, uh, <laughs> because, they're, they get this huge gut dysbiosis, right? That's the word meaning the bugs are wrong inside them, right? And, and it takes a long time to fix them. 
So it's, it's a big deal. So the question is, why don't we know more? Right? You know, we knew this was real. We knew this was real 20 years ago. You know, what were we doing spending the government's money trying to figure stuff out? Right? Why didn't why didn't we know more? So yeah. number one is it's complicated, right? There is more than 2,000 species of different different species of bacteria live in your gut. And the total number of organisms is on the order of 10 to the 13. So that's a 10 trillion organisms. That's about the same as the number of you cells that are in you. Right? So all of us sitting here are half bacteria or more. Right? That's kind of a squishy number. It used to be 10 times more bacteria. So it's hard. There's a lot of them. The second thing is up until the sequencing revolution, we couldn't study them because 70% of them are what we call anaerobes. Those are bacteria that if they get exposed to oxygen, die. That's an inconvenient way to try and grow stuff, right? Because if you're the experimenter, we actually like to have oxygen around. And so, uh, so it's hard to grow them and they're hard to get a hold of. So you can't culture them, you can't do genetics with them, everything is hard, and mostly it fails because we don't know what the right conditions for them are besides no oxygen, right? There's, and then finally, for, there's no, there are no good animal models for studying these, right? You, know, you could actually manipulate in ways that we don't have to understand. So, I want to first acknowledge people that worked on these projects with, uh, with, with us because they, of course, did way more than me, right? And so, uh, this is Maggie So, who is my colleague at the University of Arizona. Maggie is an expert in Neisseria microbiology. Uh, and I've known Maggie, I don't know, 20 years, right? And she is a terrific bacteriologist and geneticist. Uh, Matt Wooler, uh, let's do the rest of the series of people first. Uh, Daniel Powell's a postdoc in my lab, who's in fact still there, so I'm running a lab still from Hawaii and Tucson, which means that Daniel is doing most of the running of the lab. And Iris Ma, who is a graduate student in Maggie's lab. So these three people really have done a ton of the stuff on Nyseria. Then Matthew Woolard and Lydia Roberts. Matthew was a postdoc in my lab, but Matthew is now a professor at LSU. Uh, Lydia was a graduate student in my lab, but she's now, has a great title, Senior Staff Fellow at the National Institutes of Health at the Rocky Mountain Labs in Pendleton, Montana. And Tom Kuula is a Francisella, bacteriologist who was my colleague at the University of North Carolina, who was the one who sucked me into these projects. Right? Because, and Tom is now director of global health at Washington State University, who's our capital after SUNY Fremont. And who's got the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. They, they actually pay for this. And for those people who are taxpayers uh, and believe that universities actually pay for people to do research, that would actually be no. In, in fact, mostly they don't pay for anything, right? They kind of rent space from you. Uh, and so, so NIAID can pay for all of this in one way or another, in, including most of my salary and most of the time that we've worked on this, as well as everybody else. So if, if you think, and that's physical private and public universities. Okay. So why pick Neisseria, right? Uh, so there are a lot of Neisseria species. You can find them in lots of different animals. You can find them in whales and dolphins. You can find them in, in birds. You can find them in cattle. But you can't, couldn't find them in is mice. So immunologists love mice. And they love mice because you can do a lot of stuff with them. You can knock out genes. You can immunize them, you can manipulate them really easily. And, and they're small, right? The mouse is like 20 grams, about that long, or 10 years tail, right? And so you can have a lot of them. Even though you'd be horrified to learn if you actually buy a mouse from a 
mouse dealer. It's like two hundred dollars a mouse. Um, so anyway, um, and there's another bacteria called Neisseria meningitides. And Neisseria meningitides is really interesting. It's one, it's a bacteria that causes meningitis in people. But at the same time, about 10% of walking around humans have it in their throat all the time. So, I mean, it's bad when it's in your brain, right? A lot of things are bad when they're in your brain. But if it's in your throat, you're okay, fine. So we knew that Neisseria species had to be able to do stuff that wouldn't bother you very much. So we could, it was a reasonable organism to try and look at, look at this interaction. So the first thing we did, when actually when I got the Tucson, Maggie and I went, went through all the mice that we had in my lab, and bought a bunch of mice, and we asked, can we find this in any of the mice that you buy from, you know, the, from the Acme Mouse Company? Right? And the answer was, no, no, we got nothing. So Maggie and I went and had two beers each, and because uh, we're old, and that's all we can afford, and because we're going to keep all over, uh, and we said, okay, well, we'll try and figure out something even later. Um, and then we had this interaction with this guy, Michael Notman, who was on the faculty at Tucson, but is now at Berkeley. And Michael Notman convinced the National Science Foundation that what he needed to do was set traps to trap mice from the Arctic Circle going down through North America, South America, to Tierra del Fuego. And he had his students go out and, and trap mice in farms and in haystacks, and all the way on this transect. And when they came in, you know, we got one of Maggie's postdocs to say, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll see if we can find something. So he went and grabbed every mouse and put a swab inside their mouth and inflated it to see if we could find the cereal. Right, so we talked about boring and sort of hard because I, none of you guys, I'm sure, have tried to touch a wild mouse. But wild mice kind of don't like to be touched. In fact, you know, lamb mice, you know, are docile and quiet. A wild mouse can jump about that high. Right? So so to do this, you have to put, you know, you put it in the cage, put it in the sleeve, take the swab, do it, and it's, it's boring, and it takes a lot of effort. So Nate got done doing this, and if I was not, we found three places where we could recover some kind of Neisseria bacteria. Two in, in, in Alberta, and one at the Tucson Zoo, six miles away from the lab. Right. So this is only, a, this is a small list of, you know, all the mice that we Sample. So it was right there at home. Of course, we didn't know that. So this is a picture of the creature. And it's uh, a typical kind of gram negative bacteria. And it, these, these are actually susceptible, right? So that means they're actually not with bacteria, it's a cell bacteria. Well, and they grow in colonies, and actually they grow up in this kind of cool picture. Anyway, uh, and that's probably important because they live in real life, probably in biofilms, which are surfaces that the bacteria actually makes for itself so that it can be in a place where it likes, where it can regulate the oxygen tension and it can regulate the nutrients. Okay, so. so what we, we did first is we asked, can we actually now take this out of the mouse and put it into a new mouse? Right, so we went to the Acme mouse store again, and we bought a bunch of different mice. Not quite that random. We actually picked mice that were part of a thing called the Flatworth Cross, which we're not gonna talk about very much, um, which represent essentially the genetic diversity available in mice. Because we wanted to look at as much different genetic backgrounds as we could. We found a strain, uh, called CAS, which is Castanius, which is an inbred mouse strain that was derived from mice trapped in, trapped in Thailand. Uh, and it's actually from a different subspecies than Mus musculus, which is a common mouse. What you can see here is when you look at the oral cavity over time, each little dot here is a different mouse. 
And this is looking at them over time. And you can see that most of the mice get, when they get colonized, they stay colonized at about the same level for a long time. Right? So they really become colonized. And you can find them at both ends. Remember the tube we had at the beginning, right? Food in, poo out. You find it not only in their mouth, but also in their poo. And it's, so it means, so that tells you that it's not only just living in their mouth, right? But it's living through their whole GI tract and surviving. Right? So that's that's really pretty interesting. Because this is a bug that you don't see around that's really good at doing this. And it can go on for a really long time. So this is like a boring experiment because this is 52 weeks. And uh, and in fact, only really happened because uh, Iris forgot that she had mice about week 16. <laughs> and uh, we said, no, oh, shit, well, we might as well keep going. So we kept sampling them over time. At the end of 52 weeks, we necropsied the mice and with a bat. I stand in fact, the bat did it. We stood next, next to the bat. And he said, look like old mice to me. <laughs> said, no, oh, that's what they are. I see nothing. So we couldn't find anything wrong with these mice after they carried this bacteria for a year or any other time that we looked at. So that's actually pretty interesting. It's really like what a commensal is, right? It doesn't cause disease. It's there forever. And we wanted to understand, well, why? So we started looking at, at a bunch of different mice. And this is like data, real data. And so this is the number of mice kept colonized over inoculated. This is a small set of what we did, but these are the mice that come, that make up the black cross, that make up most of these. You can see that most of the mice don't get colonized at all. So only two strains of mice get colonized really efficiently, Cas and Ajax. But it says there's some genetic component of the host that's limiting or not limiting the ability of the bacteria to, to, to be, uh, Persist. So I said that before. Oh, that's too much better. So I want to go and spend a couple minutes on wreck and check biology. And that's what people who were trained as geneticists do, right? And and it's a way to try to figure out what what happens. So this is the rear axle of a Ford F one fifty. Many people have seen a rear a Ford F one fifty. And so it's got a lot of parts, you know? It's got a lot of parts in there. And, and so we do two things. The first thing we do is we want to try and do this is we grind stuff up and ask what's there. So the way we grind stuff up and look is we can look at all their genes, right? We can do these, we can sequence their DNA. We can look at their transcriptome. It's the genes that are, the RNA that's made. We can look at their proteome. It's the spectrum of all the proteins made. And we get a lot of parts, right? So you do that experiment and you get, I don't know, look at how many parts you can do. 100, 150, right? Kind of the size of a proteome from a small nothing. But, but now we have a list of things that are there. So the list of things that are there is, is useful, but it doesn't tell us how stuff works, right? It, because it's just, it's a catalog, right? So it's like doing ecology and going out and picking up everything that you see, and now we have a list of plants, or animals, or plants and animals, or whatever, right? We have a list. So that's good, right? I mean, because, because the list tells you a lot, but it doesn't tell you how they fit together, and it doesn't tell you what's important. It just gives you a list. So reductionist guys like me, what we do is we examine the parts. We look at all the parts and say, well, we guess what they might do based on what they do with other creatures that we know about, what they kind of look like by sequence analysis, what I felt like they looked like in the morning when I had my coffee or in the shower. Uh, and then we remove that part. Right? So, and then we, so we do that usually by doing molecular biology. So we can do gene editing and take that gene out of a mouse and say, okay, do we still get a mouse? Right? And then we can see if that mouse now works. So now we can impute the function of that piece, right, based on what doesn't happen now. And now we can restore it by 
in the genetics again. We're going to cross it back in with the functional genetics and now see if we fix it. So, and back here, so like, if we take out maybe this cap on the end of the axle, maybe the, the cup works just fine, right? So we say the cap is not necessary for the truck to be able to be a truck. But if I take out you know, the gear here in the middle of the differential, and we get in and it drives off the end of the, the factory line, it's got no gear in the differential, the guy starts it up, starts fine, puts the truck in gear, that works, he puts on the, steps on the gas, and nothing happens, right? Because the truck won't work without that. So he says, ah, that gear is really important. We'll do that. So that's how wreck and check molecular biologists and geneticists view the world. So we started to do that. Uh, uh, and what we did was we asked if we took mice, which fortunately other people had made, that had broken bits of the immune system where we kind of knew what they did, right? So there's a, so I told to this little cheat sheet here for what they do, right? So mighty 88, which is a gene which is really important, it's a global defect in innate immunity. So that's the immune response that goes on without previous exposure to anything. Uh, or RAGS, which is another gene which has an intact innate immunity, but broken adaptive immunity. So that's the antibody responses, the T cell responses, the things that you think about what happens after you get better. A gene called TLR4, which is important in innate immunity, but not globally, but in the response to bacteria. Because it's a gene whose protein recognizes a part of the outside of the bacteria, but not viruses and not a lot of other stuff. And the, this is a spontaneous mutant from that same gene, and a gene from your IL-6 receptor. So at the risk of dropping into the weeds, this is a, um, this is a signaling molecule that's important in generating the immune response and regulating it. So what you can see here is, if you look at what fraction of them get colonized, you can see that IDA8 is like really important in blocking colonization because everybody gets colonized when they're broken. And RAG's fine, right? So that tells you something really important. It says the ability to be colonized is not due to the adaptive immune system, which is the one, which this was like the wrong answer for me if I spent my whole career on the adaptive immune system, uh, is not important in regulating whether this bacteria can now find a home. So it tells you that that's not important, but this innate part, which is the happens first, is really critical. So, so we can then ask questions. So this is the hint, right? This is the, we broke it. Now we can ask, well, we seem to have a hint that the innate immune system is really important. So if we now stimulate cells in tissue culture from mice or from cell lines with NMUS, or this is the control, that normally you get a good response, but now you don't get a response in this mouse. So it says that that's actually what's really important. That at least correlates strongly with this lack of innate recognition, because this also, this, this mouse doesn't have innate recognition. So we never tested that before. So that says it's probably the same defect. So NMOS takes advantage of the difference the innate immune system to do, to do find itself a home. So, and what it uses is it uses a whole bunch of genes, which we're not going to talk about, that, that's attached to cells and that we normally stimulate but now don't. So it takes advantage of a defect or a difference the ability of a host to recognize a particular innate signal. Okay, so good. We work on time. That's good. Uh, so I want to talk about a different bug. This is where you know I shouldn't have done this. But so Francis L. Tularensis is named after Tulare County in California, where it was first described. And it's, it was described first by a physician uh, called Fran Francis. That's his last name. So we knew about this for a long time. It's a zoonotic gram-negative bacteria. It's a cause of uh, rabbit fever, which in the US is 
Dan, if you're a rabbit hunter or you're a rancher, or you're a gardener on Martha's Vineyard, uh, those people seem to get it a lot. Uh, and it's in the environment. So the, the major epicenter of this disease in the US is in Missouri. Pretty cool, huh? Um, but it's maintained in the environment, probably in small animals. It turns out it's endemic in Sweden. And the Swedes get it in the summertime. Because in the summertime, you know, it's light all the time in the summertime, as opposed to the wintertime in Sweden when it's dark and cold. So it turns out the Swedes like to go out a lot. And they like to have picnics. They have picnics along streams and in parks and things. And when they, in the summertime, when they have these picnics, they get bitten by mosquitoes and ticks and midges and all kinds of uh, creatures that can actually carry this uh, bacteria in the nose. And so they get a, a bunch of them every summer. Uh, so then, so it's actually, it's actually in Sweden, it's actually a pretty real problem. Right? Those people get pretty sick. Uh, it's not transmitted from person to person, which means epidemiologists like that because it simplifies doing epidemiology. You don't have to worry about people catching it from somebody else. Uh, so, unlike uh, Nyseria that we talked about, this guy doesn't do very much early. But what it does is it breaks the adaptive immune response. So this is the other side of the coin. It likes to grow inside cells. Uh, and it does the following thing. It's Prostaglandin E2 is a, a molecule which is important in inflammation. And you know, if you take aspirin, aspirin is a cyclooxygenase inhibitor, right, which is the enzyme that two steps above takes EGE2. And it's why it works so well as a pain reliever and anti inflammatory, because it blocks the synthesis of, of that molecule. So, that allows it, so what that does is, inflammation is really important in generating subsequent immune responses. So without inflammation, you don't get an immune response. The bacterium makes the cell, it doesn't make PGE2 itself, but it makes the cell make PGE2 to, to now block inflammation, which blocks the adaptive response. Pretty cool, huh? That's a really clever idea if you're a bacterium. You know, you, you, Pardon? Yeah, it's protecting itself. Yeah, it's protecting itself. But it's protecting itself not by having something that does it, but by making the host do something that's against the host's interest, but it's good for the bacteria. Yeah, isn't that cool? Yeah. Uh, so, this is really, this is very good. Okay, so who cares? All right, so it's an intracellular pathogen, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it persists in the environment. It's infectious as aerosols, ingestion, skin contact, and arthropod bites. For those who care about such things, uh, it was used as a, as a germ warfare weapon in the Second World War by the Japanese and China. Uh, it was used by the Russians, excuse me, Soviets, in the Second World War in the siege of Stalingrad, which of course they deny using. Uh, but, but the story is uh, the vectors in that part of uh, Europe is, is usually rabbits. And in the wintertime, there was an outbreak of tularemia in the Wehrmacht. Okay, there's not, like, not a lot of rabbits in Russia in the wintertime that spread the disease. Uh, and then when uh, Russia, when the, when the Soviets broke out of Stalingrad, and went over the same area that the Germans had previously occupied, there was an outbreak of tularemia in the Soviet army. Go figure. Uh, so that's the data, right? The inference is somebody was using it. Uh, the mechanisms of pathology are really still poorly understood, and uh, it's the way you resist it is not really very clear. Uh, so, we know adaptive immune responses are critical for recovery from infection. So without an adaptive response, that's the
specific kind of response that happens late and it's what we try and make when you get your flu shot to try and make an adaptive immune response. So how does this bug do stuff? Well, one of the things it does is it does have a DNA response. It has an LPS, which is the molecule that tweaks TLR4, which we talked about before. And its LPS doesn't bind TLR4, so it wants to be bind. But the, it inhibits this pro-inflammatory cytokine by PG2. All right, so we found this in a really kind of bizarre way. We had made a very large number of things that we call T cell hybrids, which rep represent individual T cells. Uh, and we were trying to be able to identify what parts of the bacteria were used by the immune system for, to, find, to find the bacteria. And so we had a bunch of these, and we had made these uh, because when we started this work, the Institutional File Safety Committee, those of you who don't work in institutions like that, so tells you what you can and cannot do. We started working on this, and they wouldn't let us immunize mice with live organisms. So we killed them and immunized them. We got a bunch of these clones, and we put them out on a plate. Later, we were allowed to start to use live organisms, but we tested the ones we had against dead organisms and then against live organisms. And what you see here is this pattern, so we're in there red like this, is that red or is that orange? Anyway, when you see those colors, that means they've adapted. This half of the plate and this half of the plate have the same distribution of cells on them, right? So this cell is the same as this cell. We stimulate it with dead bugs. You can see we get a pattern of lots, we get a fair number of ones that you recognize. We stimulate it with live bugs. We don't get anything. So that tells us right away that the live bacteria is doing something to come make the cells not recognize it. Right? Because it's the same cells. There's no difference in the cells. It's, it's the bugs that are different. It's the stimulation that's different. And it doesn't even have to be the bug. We did an antigen experiment where he took supernatants from infected cells, sterilized them by passing through some null through a 0.2 micron filter, so there's no bacteria there. In fact, they're sterile, and added those to cultures, right? With no stimulated with dead bacteria, so they actually respond fine. So this is the uninfected guys, and you get this much response. And if you titer the supernatant, that is, add different amounts of the supernatant to those cultures, you can see that if you have a high concentration of blocks, and then you can dilute the effect. Right? So that tells you that. There's something in that stuff that makes the T cells not work. Is there's, there's no bacteria there, right? This is just something in the, the supernatant. So, supernatants are terrible, right? Because there are a lot of molecules, right? Because you know, there's stuff in dead cells, there's stuff in the host cells, there's all kinds of stuff. And, and Matthew and I had what, so we call a come to Jesus meeting. And we had a talk about what we were going to do. And I said, we should write this up and go home. And never talk, never speak of it again, because your entire career can go down the toilet. Try it chasing a molecule like this. Right? And he said, I don't want to do that. I want to actually chase. So okay. We have six months. After that, you're done with this, right? You've got an answer, you're, you're done. And the first things we did were, we tried to kill the molecule from the supernatants. How can we kill the molecule from the supernatants? So we had enzymes like trypsin, cut up proteins. Doesn't have any of that. We had nucleases, DNAs and RNAs, right? To kill nucleic acid, so is it RNA or DNA that's actually doing this? That doesn't do anything. We put it through, we, me we measure its size. So there's columns we can separate molecules by size. And there are big molecules like proteins, and there are small molecules. This is like a really small molecule, right? It's less than 3,000 molecular weight. That's, that's small, right? There's a lot of those, not to mention pieces of other things that are that size. We put it in, in boiling water for 20 minutes, right? So what that does is it turns it into an egg, you know, a hard boiled egg. Right? So all the proteins are dead. 
most things are dead, and we're still fine. So it's a small knowledge. So we remembered a talk uh, from a long time before about what, what PGE2 did. And we did block T cell activation. So we said, what could block T cell activation? Right? So we said, well, it has the same list of properties that are stopped for us. So I said, ah, maybe it's PG2. So the first experiment is, uh, is to use one of these broken mice, right, which doesn't know how to make PG2. So it's missing the enzyme that makes PG2. And we ask, okay, don't, will those mice respond? So this is the control that doesn't respond to wild type, but in fact, this mouse responds just fine. So, and then we asked, is there actually PG2 there? And there is. So that was fine. So we then asked the question about the bacteria. So we asked, what genes in the bacteria are required to make the mouse make PG2? So we're not asking about the host anymore. We're asking not only about the bacteria. So we did an experiment with a library, the Colin Boyle's lab. So what Gallagher in Collins lab did is he took the bacteria and put in a transposon. So a transposon is a piece of DNA that knows how to move around. And this was one that actually only goes in once. So he put it in made 25,000 clones, each, each with a piece of DNA that breaks one of its genes. We don't know which one, but it breaks one of them. And then what they did was they sequenced out from where the transposon went in to identify the gene where the transposon blocked itself. So now we have a set of identified bacteria with one gene knocked out, right? One gene was knocked out in this bacteria. We knew exactly which gene it was. So we took and put out a, a library that is one bacteria in each well, 3,000 wells, which essentially covered every gene that bacteria one at a time that was not required for life. Right? So essentially all of their uh, genes which are accessory functions or luxury functions or however you want to call it, non-essential genes. We then took each of those colonies and asked when we infected them, do they make PG2? Right? We use them, we infect the mouse cell, said that PG2 get it. So this is the kind of experiment that you either never want to talk about again, or it's great. And this is a subset of the data, but what it shows is these are each different mutant, right? And this is PG2 production. And you can, don't actually have to be very smart or know very much to know that these genes here are required for PG2, the ability to, to induce PG2 production. So that's good. So they, and the number turns out to be a good number. So they're bad numbers, like 500. That would be a bad number. You should never figure that out. Two is not such a good number because it could be something else, right? But you know, so this was 20, 19, and so we mapped them on the bacterial chromosome. So this is a they have a circular chromosome. A bunch of them mapped here. Turns out what those genes there do is they're export ones. Right? They're responsible for taking molecules inside a bacteria and shoving them out. Right? And so export clumps are really important because that's how most antibiotic resistance works. Right? Is that bacteria know how to take, recognize a molecule, catch it to something, and then pump it out. Right? So they're now resistant to that antibiotic because they get rid of it. So we, were not, we weren't interested in those because we weren't, didn't want to know about pumps, but we wanted to know about molecules that actually did something to the host. So these would be responsible for getting the molecule out of the bacteria into the host, but not interesting in terms of trying to figure out what we're doing. So we picked one called CLIP-B. And CLIP-B, it turns out, it's a chaperone protein. So those of you who don't know what chaperones <laughs> are, I didn't think that. <laughs> what chaperones are, are there proteins that 
hold other proteins while they're folding. And so they can really detect a fair number of different proteins. So <coughs> I went back and asked, what impact, what's the impact of not being able to make BG2? And so this is just looking at the response. This is looking at BG2 production. And, and you can see, if you look in the lungs, which is where the infection occurs, you usually can get BG2 produced. And if you use a drug that blocks BG2, you can block BG2, and you block BG2, uh, you now increase the immune response. So if I block BG2, the immune response kind of goes up. Okay, so, so this is the 15 minute clock that Professor said, right? I'm 49 minutes right now. So, um, so, so what, what I want to emphasize again is these people that Maggie and Daniel and Iris do the sexual health lab work. Um, okay, so Daniel and Iris, Maggie's a professor, right? so she doesn't actually do any of these things. I don't refer to that as useful. It's okay, fun. That was our job. Yeah. Uh, and Matthew and Lydia. All, essentially all the work on the tour of India. Uh, and Tom did their thing useful except for get money. So all that stuff. <laughs> and so the take homes of these are there are really cool ways that bacteria and host talk to each other. They're idiosyncratic in that they're unique for each bacteria host interaction. And there's not just one. Right? So there's not just one thing. You know, I mentioned this PG, I spent a lot of time on it talking about PG2, but I just blew by the fact that their LPS doesn't seem to be dating stuff. So bacteria have lots of ways to influence their hosts. The influence is really important in what, what is the outcome of those interactions. So with Neisseria, if you have too much of a robust response, you don't allow the bacteria to essentially become part of your normal flora and do nothing. Right? Right? Although you do make an immune response, and I didn't talk about that. Because if you get colonized, you make a perfectly good immune response to this kind of thing. So what I wanted to bring home is that there is a continuum of things which are pathogens, right? To things which actually do something good for you. And there's kind of everything in between. There's no sharp dichotomy between microbes that are bad and microbes that are good. But in fact, they all live on a continuum. Mycerium lives on a continuum. You know, a related species to meningitis causes gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is almost commensal, right? That is, you know, women get infected with gonorrhea and can show essentially no symptoms, except for this sterility thing, but you know, uh, they seem to care about it. <laughs> uh, but, but in fact, you know, there are no overt symptoms. Uh, and meningitis you know, lives in the throat of lots of us you know, forever without causing any problem. So we're trying to understand all the parts. We're unfortunately right, right where we are. You know, we're still taking parts out of way that had an axle. Right? And trying to figure out, OK, I take that part out, what does it do? What does it do to this axle? Well, instead of giving me the Ford F-150, what if I think there's a, a, a Chevy Tahoe? If I take that same part out of a Chevy Tahoe, does it do the same thing? So the answer is, sometimes. Sometimes not, right? And so we're, try, we're still laboring hard trying to figure out how to put things together. Now, at the same time, we now have 40 tons of data from next generation sequencing. And we don't know how to use that because right? it's too much information. You know, it's, if you thought about that in rheumatologists, and instead of you know looking to see what rabbits eat, all you did was you took DNA from everything in your plot, right? And you had plant DNA, rabbit DNA, chipmunk DNA, and whatever. And now, okay. How do things go together? And it's kind of where we are, right? Because we don't know how to put them together yet. But we like to put them together. And 
so those of us who are old school, like do like one little thing, this does this, figure out that. And so that's kind of where we are. I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about kind of any immunology questions you have. Sir. So um, thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I got about 65% of it. So maybe that makes me danger, dangerous enough to ask you a hard question. Uh, good. So I, like um, as a, I understand as a molecular and cellular biologist uh, and the, the truck axle analogy, that sometimes you need to know all the parts and try and really get into, begin to understand and try and figure out, let's just start putting two parts together. I stole that analogy. Okay. That's very well stolen. <laughs> um, and at a certain point, and this is where I need to self-deprecate, um, we ecologists run away and we, we get very sophisticated statistical models and we say, you know what? Maybe it's not so much in the details, maybe it's in the larger trends. So that the answer to the question about um, the meningitis and whether we should care or not, is it, um, you know, from a social, or from a diet standpoint, let's say across societies, maybe we should just eat healthier um, that now is. that we know, <laughs> well, and, and you use some of the parts, uh, some of the pieces that you're detecting to inform larger public health or other initiatives so that, uh, yeah, so that you can move forward or, or, so, or say so, there's a value. So, so ecologists are like public health guys, mm -hmm. right? They're the same, right? They're, they're mostly people who fail to see the gas map. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so they, they love, they, they really love correlations, right? Uh, High fat diets, people who have really high fat diets have a lot of coronary artery disease. Therefore, coronary artery disease is caused by high fat diet. Right? 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 Well, I didn't say that, right? I mean, it has been said. And, you know, uh, and it said, you know, in the, even in the face of data that says, for example, the amount of cholesterol you eat is not very closely correlated with the amount of cholesterol you eat. So that's kind of a messy thing, you know. Okay. So, uh, so a as you try and do that, what they're great at, you know, I think what the epi people are, are really good at posing questions, right? That is generating hypotheses. And ecologists are great at doing that. And, and I love ecologists because they can actually, you know, I learned all, all about entropy from ecologists as opposed to the ones I learned. I think it's really important, but I, I think what we have to do, we, the global we have to do, is we have to work hard to bridge those gaps. So we need to take things that ecologists think are important and say, okay, it is true that it's the big picture. No question that it's, that's, that's a true thing. But the big picture's got like, a lot of dots in it, right? And, and how do we figure out which dots are important to change? Right? And you can say, well, we'll do something which we think globally changes that. So we'll change the microbiome, right, and see if you if your kids still get vitamin D or whether they get allergies. Right? There's a wonderful set of papers on uh, all over Amish and Hutterites that they did Pennsylvania. So I don't know how you guys know about those, but you know the Amish are the guys who drive around in the buggies, right? And they and they all have small farms, right? They have individual small farms. Their houses are close to their farms. The Hutterites live communally. So there's a sort of a dormitory kind of complex. The farms are over here, right? Pretty far away. Amish kids never get allergies. They're in the farms with their parents, pitching hay, mucking out stalls, you know, being filthy, right? The Hutterite kids are living in this nice clean dorm when mom and dad are over in the, in the barn two miles away, they, don't get, they get allergies just like everybody else. You know, the kids who live in cities, right? So the hygiene hypothesis is the biggest, I think, argument that it's real, right? Because you have two groups of people, they all came from the same stock in Holland 100 years ago, and 
so there's this huge disparity in the incidence of, of allergies in those two populations. Now, that doesn't tell me anything about how that works, right? I got nothing. So I say, let your kids eat dirt, right? Let them, let them play on the floor with the dog and the cat and the guinea pig and whatever else you have in your house and the gulls and whatever else is around. Because, sure, uh, but I would really like to know which of those things is important, right? And I, 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 it's hard to figure out from that kind of observation. There's data on, on their microbiomes that says they're different. One's got more permacuse than the other. Well, there's like 100 species of permacuse. Are they all the same? They all do the same thing? And the idea now is that there are now, God forbid, interactomes, right? Where people are trying to figure out microbe one interacts with microbe two and microbe three and they form a little community and they cross feed each other. And each of those players can be substituted by other players uh, because the, what's important is not their identity, but what they do, right? The biochemistry of how they live, what they excrete, what they require. I think that's almost certainly true, but boy, is that hard to understand, right? Because now we get into sort of I want to say kind of statistical mechanics kinds of interactions where we can substitute, you know, three from column A, five from column B, seventeen from column C, and D, E, F, and I don't know how complicated these things really are. And so what we really need is some way to look at those in a simple way. So I love that stuff, right? I mean, I think it's really important, and I think I'm too stupid to understand that. Yeah. That's where AI comes in. I think we've, we've, as ecologists, we've come to a point where there's so many data points that are here, uh, geneticists, there's so many points that we can't put them together to look at the functions of them. And so we're moving towards that way. And it's just simply, we have to realize the limitations of our old brains. Right, no, I, I do. And um, my, my son, who got his PhD in bioinformatics, worked on trying to devise methodology, computer methodologies to look at large data sets to find interactions that you should be looking for. Because as an immunologist, we say, oh, look at CD4 cells and CD8 cells and damage interferon production. But maybe that's not the right thing to look at. Because now we can get, you know, transcriptomes from, and people have thousands of data points in them for each observation, and you can't, can't do that, right? I can't do that. And I think you're, you're absolutely right. And but we're not there yet. I mean, the AIs don't, AIs don't do it well yet. And the algorithms don't yet exist. And, and I gotta say, one of the things that I was disappointed in is that my son decided to go work for Google, which paid twice as much as you know, any academic job. Uh, so, which I understand, you know, <laughs> but but in fact, you know, these industrial people. <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think that that set of questions is the same set of questions that the finance guys like, and Google cares about because they want to know how many ads to show you, and you know, all those things are the it's the same question: how do I take all this data and make something actionable? So I want to know something better than. Tell my kids okay to eat the dog food, right? which my kids did, but it was, and they were fine, and they didn't get out. That's an anecdote. <laughs> it's not a big one. Yeah. What happens to a human infected with rabbit fever? So, depends on the rabbit infected. So, the most common is you get. Atypical millinery pneumonia, and bacteria uh, lives in your lungs, and then you get a reaction of the lungs, and it goes up water, and you die. That would be a bad outcome. Uh, often you get a partially effective immune response, and people tend not to get diagnosed very rapidly, and, and people do a 
great case presentation, case conference, where guy was put on four courses of the wrong antibiotics. So, um, so it turns out that this bacteria has a gene called lactamase, which digests penicillin and all the penicillin analogs. So, so you give people penicillin, which is cheap, right? It's, and so they doesn't clear the infection. And ultimately, he wound up, he bounced like three community docs into a tertiary care medical center where somebody said, oh yeah, this Fretlinger guy gave a talk about this. Maybe we should look for this. And so they did, and they got the right drug, got, got better. But it also can cause skin lesions, and the skin lesions get pretty nasty at the end, and they tend not to heal. So you get big suffering sores at the site of the infection. Also, it can hit your joints. Because in your joints, you essentially get the same kind of response, and you get what looks like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, but in fact, you know, test tubes rheumatoid arthritis, and have rheumatoid arthritis. And so you can have a bleed there as well. So it can be a lot of places and do a lot of things. Uh, but the most common is when you get infected by inhaling the bacteria, which you get is you get an ammonia, which is diffuse on both lungs, and uh, it's not a good thing. And even better, if, you're, if you like developing bioweapons, is it takes a long time to die. So if you, if you want to weaponize something, it's even better to make the other guys not dead, but sick. So they not, so they not only can't fight, but they can't, because it takes other people to take care of them. Um, so it was a, there was a big flurry of interest in this organism right after the anthrax letters, uh, because the US had actually made it into a weapon and so the Soviets, which turned out, I mean, I think this is a great story. I discovered what weaponized means, right? We thought there was gonna be, put a bunch of antibiotic resistance genes in and do fancy stuff. It's not fancy stuff. What you do is you put it inside an artillery shell and you shoot it. So you know where the shell lands and you can reculture the bacteria. And when you do that four or five times, you select bacteria that are resistant to being shot out of a cannon. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty disgusting, right? But, it was, but not, not fancy. Uh, so don't get it, and especially don't get it in Hawaii, because no one can afford it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. stuff they sell you actually doesn't actually colonize your gut. It's just, I mean, it goes in and comes in the tube, right? It goes in the sand, comes out that end. And, and it's just extensive additives to people who are. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, thanks again to Sarah yeah. and the library. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, the library, and thank you, everybody, for listening to somebody speaking some foreign language. <laughs> <laughs>